Dear students, today we'll have a lesson on Babur, the founder of the Mughal Empire and also on his political achievements. He was from Central Asia and one of the successors of Timur and Genghis Khan. His father was Umar Sheikh Mirza. After the death of his father in 1494, Babur got the ancestral property of Fargana. But he had something big uh, desires in his life. He wanted to do something great. So he crossed the river Indus and he invaded India for five times. In 1519, he captured Vera. In 1526, in the first battle of Panipat, he defeated the last ruler of the Delhi Sultanate, Ibrahim Lodi, who belonged from the Lodi dynasty. Now we will highlight the importance of the first battle of Panipat in the medieval Indian history. As I have discussed earlier that after this battle, Babur became the founder of the Mughal dynasty in India. He defeated Ibrahim Lodi, who was the last ruler of the Delhi Sultanate and he belonged from the Lodi dynasty. Now the question is how he defeated Ibrahim Lodi in this battle and why this battle was regarded as a landmark in the medieval Indian history. According to Anil Chandra Banerjee, when Babur entered in India before the first battle of Panipat, he had 12,000 troops. Babur was very strong in artillery, both in matchlock and guns. Unfortunately, Ibrahim Lodi had no artillery and his army was huge, but as he had no idea about the artillery, especially I'm talking about gunpowder, so he failed to defeat Babur and Babur successfully defeated Ibrahim Lodi and established his empire. But we should not overhype the significance of the first battle of Panipat, though it was definitely a landmark in the history of medieval India. But the political importance of this battle, I think that we should re-examine. On 27th April 1526, the Khutbah was read in his name and Babur became or he was recognized or considered as the emperor of Hindustan. When Babur became the ruler of India, he had to face the protests from the several Afghan leaders of the different centers like Sambal, Bayana, Dholpur, Gwalior, etc. So he was in a serious crisis and his intention was to suppress the Afghan leaders and to establish his power or his authority over them. In 1527, Babur fought a decisive battle with one of the great Rajput leaders of that time. He was Rana Sangha of Mewar. Babur defeated him in the Battle of Khanwa. It was the second important battle after the first battle of Panipat in the journey of Babur's political achievements in India. In 1529, there was another battle which was fought between Babur and the Afghan chips and this battle was known as the Battle of Ghogra and in this battle the Afghans they had one lakh men under the leadership of Mahmud Lodi. This battle was fought at the confluence of the rivers Ganga and Gogra. That's why this battle was known as the Battle of Gogra. 
after these three battles, Babar ultimately became the unchallenged ruler of Hindustan. But being an administrator, he was not that much efficient and competent like his grandson Akbar. Definitely, he was the founder of the Mughal Empire. But if we consider his efficiency and efficacy as the ruler of Hindustan, then we should consider the fact that he did nothing for his subjects. Rather, he was more engaged in wars to establish his power or to nourish the newborn Mughal Empire. Definitely, it was a phase of crisis where the attention from the part of the emperor was needed in a great extent. Unfortunately, Babar failed to fulfill those demands, but it was definitely through him India got an opportunity to witness a new epoch in its history. Now we will highlight about Babar's army. With the help of this army, Babar defeated Ibrahim Lodi and he established the Mughal Empire in India. I have already highlighted that Babar introduced gunpowder in India and he was extremely efficient in artillery, both in matchlocks and guns. Babar's army consisted of Turks, Mongols, Iranians and Afghans. It was built as a veteran corps which had been campaigning alongside him for over a decade and thus the troops and comrades were very much confident. It also had an element of equality where any trooper could dine with Babur or give his opinion on tactics in contrast with the hierarchical structure which was maintained in the army of Delhi Sultanate. So, Babur had a cordial relationship with all his soldiers and by this way he tried to follow the norms of equality that made his troopers confident and also loyal to him. Perhaps this kind of attitude was absent in the army of the Delhi Sultanate. The army was organized along the Timurid lines. And who was Timur? Timur was one of the ancestors of Babur. In his army, I am talking about Babur's army, we find the units of 10, 50, 100, 500 and 1000. Babur's army at Panipat, at the Battle of Panipat, the most important battle in Babur's life, numbered around 15,000 to 20,000. The bulk of them were Timurid cavalry supplemented by Turkish gunners with gunpowder, matchlocks and cannons. Till now, an unknown feature in the Indian battlefield. Now I will discuss about the specific aspects of Babur's army. Cavalry was 
the centerpiece of the Mughal army. Babur's horsemen would have been composed of horse archers, mainly Mongols, recruited from Central Asia and masters of steppe warfare and also Turks and heavy melee cavalry who may also use bows. Even the horse archers in the Mughal army wore full armor. So from the technological point of view, Babur was very much prepared and he had a vast knowledge about the military tactics as well as the scientific advancements in the field of warfare which existed during that time. Unfortunately, the Sultans, they had very meager idea about the latest developments in the field of warfare. Babur's infantry was of two main types, foot archers armed with composite bows and a secondary weapon and more importantly matchlock musketeers. Ratio of archers to matchlock men was 4 is to 1. Both weapons had about the same effective range of 100 yards. But bowmen had almost three times the rate of fire while matchlocks had unparalleled armor penetration and lethality capable of stopping a horse or even an elephant dead in its tracks. It should be pointed out that the Afghan army definitely it was not that much skillful in the field of artillery but they had a huge uh, troops of soldiers as well as they had numerous elephants and also horsemen. Machlok musketeers were called Tufang or Bandakchi and used a protective mantle as a cover when firing the weapon. Matchlock men in Babur service were mostly of Turkish origin. How Babur planned everything was definitely a matter of appreciation. Unfortunately, Ibrahim Lodi was not that much prepared and he had no plan for this battle with Babur. If I take his example as my case study. Ibrahim Lodi, he was the last ruler of the Delhi Sultanate. He had money, he had manpower. On the other hand, if I make a comparative study between the military resources of Ibrahim Lodi and Babur, what I have found that with his meager army, Babur defeated Ibrahim Lodi with the help of technology. And what was that technology? The usage of gunpowder. Gunpowder weapons were introduced in Central Asia by the Mongols who brought them from China. But these were very rudimentary, mainly siege devices. The Ottomans developed gunpowder weapons quite early along with the Europeans. So the technique came from China. It was developed by the Ottomans as well as the Europeans. What is the technique I'm talking about? The technique of using gunpowder in the battlefield. For the basic models which Babur used were Zarp Zan, that means 
light cannon, kazan, that means heavy cannon, kazan e buzurg, that means seize gun, and firingi, that means anti personal gun. Babur's artillery used only stone shot. Stone was cheap and plentiful. But the production of stone cannon balls was extremely labor intensive. Babur knew that he had limited resources because he came from a different country. He came from Central Asia. On the other hand, it was his intention to defeat his opponent with his skills and with his intelligence. So, Babur made it possible with the application of his intellect or his intelligence in this particular field of military warfare. Metal was more expensive during his time, but metal shot was much easier to make. So instead of using stone, Babur used metal. Stone projectiles were not as dense as metal and transferred less energy to the target but they might also shatter on impact producing lethal sharp nail as a secondary effect. Metal ammunition did have one very important advantage it could be made hollow. When left empty such projectiles were lighter and could travel further. When loaded with gunpowder, they could be fused to explode on impact. They were not horse drawn, but rather mounted on carriages. Babur had 20 cannons at Panipat. So, definitely he came from a different place. It is not a different continent, but in Central Asia, the people were more aware during the time of Babur about the scientific advancements, about the technological upliftments in the field of warfare than the part where he invaded and also where he established his empire. I am talking about India. The rulers of Delhi Sultanate, they were so much engrossed in luxury, they had very little time for any kind of advancements which were taking place either in science or in technology and also in the other fields of knowledge. Babur was smart enough to take the advantage of the situation and he made himself the champion of the situation and he founded the Mughal Empire which had a rich history of 350 years, almost 350 years in the Indian subcontinent. I would like to mention about Babur's autobiography which is known to us as tuzuk e babri or Babur Nama. It was written in Turkey the mother tongue of Babur. It was translated into Persian for four times during the 16th and the 17th centuries. With 
this autobiography, we get an idea about Babur's life, especially his journey from Central Asia to South Asia, his journey from Samarkand to Hindustan. In his autobiography, Babur mentioned his memories related to his native land, his days in India, about his subjects, about the culture, religion, and also about the surroundings which he witnessed in this new country. Till the end of his life, Babur always had very much affection and love for his native place. His love for his native place was also reflected in his writings from his autobiography, Babar Nama. We come to know about a solo traveler who came from Central Asia to South Asia for the search of destiny or of fortune. And he established an empire which had an immense impact on the culture, politics, and also on the economy of the Indian subcontinent. Dear students, at the end of our lecture, I would like to conclude by saying few words about Babur's character. He was a great poet and a nature lover. We have come to know about all these qualities of Babur from his autobiography, Babur Nama. He was an orthodox Sunni Muslim, but he gave some concessions to the Shias. He established his empire in India. Definitely, with the time, he became a part of the culture and of the heritage of our country. But he always had a deep respect and love for his native land, for Samarkand and also for Kabul. After his death, his body was removed from India to Kabul and his present grave is in Kabul. Lastly, we should say he was definitely a soldier with a lot of skills and intellect. He was brave, he was courageous and he made the way which was followed later by his grandson Akbar to establish an empire of great repute. In this lecture, what we have studied or what we have discussed, we discussed about Babur, about his political as well as something on his military achievements, his early life, invasions of India, the first battle of Panipat, which took place in 1526, the battle of Khanwa in 1527, the battle of Gogra, in 1529, political achievements of Babur, Babur's army, his autobiography, and lastly, his character.